This episode of the MusicCast podcast is brought to you by F-Flat Books. If you are looking for practical, flexible resources for your music classroom, head to fflatbooks.com. That's fflat books.com. When you head over there, check out the innovative eBooks and lesson plans that can be used in your music classroom today. And just for our MusicCast listeners, if you use the code MusicCast20, that's M-U-S-I-C-A-S-T-20, at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your entire purchase. All right, folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the MusicCast podcast. And we, um, this time, have our first repeat offender or a person who didn't have such a terrible time that he decided to come back and join us again. And that is um, Aaron. Aaron, thanks for coming back to chat with us yeah. again. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So we wanted to kind of do like a, a bit of an extension. And I think that this is going to release more or less right after um, your last podcast. But we want to do a bit of an extension and talk about kind of one of the, the programs and stuff that's set up where you teach. So just to give uh, people a refresher, do you mind give us a quick extra rundown of like where you teach right now in country wise yeah. and grade level? Sure. Uh, hey y'all. Uh, my name's Aaron Duggar. If you can't figure out by the y'all I just threw in there, <laughs> I am a band director down in Texas. It like, it pains me to have said y'all because I am from Pennsylvania. I grew up South of Pittsburgh, uh, went to Penn state and then came down here to Texas. Uh, right now I'm a, an assistant band director at Prosper high school which is just north of Dallas, about 30 minutes. Does it hurt anywhere inside to say y'all instead of yins? It, it does, it, yeah. And my family still has a hard time whenever I, I throw a y'all in there. But it's give a just, little, like... Right, it just happens. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know when I picked it up or how I picked it up, but it's just it's there. I didn't realize, like, I grew up mostly out there. I grew outside. I grew up outside of Philly, and people talk about accents, and I feel like I never really had one, and I never noticed when people did. And then I went to Duquesne in Pittsburgh, and all of a sudden, that's the first time I felt like, oh, the accents are not just, like, <laughs> an overseas or boundaries. So, um, for yeah. sure. But so in Texas, um, we talked a little bit about this, and I actually don't have much exposure to this at all. And I'm interested in this conversation because Marissa has worked in Texas, and she moved back up to PA. So we kind of have like three levels of, I have no earthly idea on this topic. You're like ingrained in this right now. And Marissa has experienced both. And that's the topic of um, UIL. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a, um, a very brief overview of what is UIL exactly before we go deeper. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so UIL is it's short for the University Interscholastic League. Um, and it is basically a, the governing body that oversees aspects of education in Texas. Um, and there's different avenues of it. There's UIL uh, athletics, UIL academics, uh, and one of them is UIL music. Um, and that's kind of the umbrella that we all fall under as a music program in Texas. And uh, within that, there's different sub-organizations that govern band and orchestra and choir, uh, all the way down through to general music uh, and they set certain guidelines for us that uh, to maintain our programs, we, we have to follow. So when you say it's like a governing idea above everything, is this, is this similar to our state standards, kind of our PA state standards to that level, but a little more enforced? Uh, similar, a little more enforced and a lot. Um, there's just a lot more to it. Um, they, they govern everything from how many hours we can practice a week at marching band to uh, what music we're allowed to take to contest in the spring. Um, so that they pretty much cover all the basis uh, of how a program operates and functions on a daily basis. So for your perspective as a director, what is, um, what's the, what's the, the benefit of that oversight? Cause from my perspective up here, I feel like a lot of what defines programs to an extent is number one, what the school is willing to, or the school community is willing to like put into it and support and number two, what the directors are willing to do and give the time to do and parents or sorry, parents and students for that regard too. But this sounds like it's a little more uh, relegated and regimented in your regard. It is. Uh, and kind of having the outside uh, perspective, um, what you just mentioned is like a, it's a positive and a negative. Um, some of the negatives can come from um, we 
aren't able, the UIL isn't able to see what goes on day to day in our programs. Um, so they don't know that my fourth band kids couldn't play a concert F three months ago, but they do know that in three months, there is a standard that those kids are expected to be at. Um, and having those standards uh, is, I think the driving force behind how Texas band programs got to where they did and how Texas music um, has advanced, honestly, to be one of the best in the country. Um, and I, I think it's because there are a certain set of guidelines and standards that every director, every program is held to. Um, and again, that has its pros and its cons, but at the end of the day, it has ingrained music education as part of the day-to-day -day curriculum of the schools. So when you're an administrator or um, someone who's making those decisions about where to give the money, where to send the funds, where to give the support, um, the music programs come up in those conversations because we are part of that curriculum um, that they see come across their desk. Um. Hold on, I want to ask a quick question. Go ahead. So you've worked in a smaller school like Melissa, and now you're at, you're at Prosper. And how big is Prosper? Uh, right now, Prosper has about 20,000 students in it, um, and it is the fastest growing district in Texas right now. Um, okay. So, yeah, I've had both sides. I've had the small school 4A, and now um, I'm at a 6A. So do you see a difference in the music programs based on the size, or – like, is it driven by, how am I trying to ask this question? Are the bigger bands better because you have more kids to pull from because it's, you know, you have that, those larger ensembles or is it truly driven just by the standards? Um, the size of the school absolutely has something to do with it. And that's just because with size comes more money. With size comes a bigger pool of kids to pull from. Um, and there are um, different variations of the standards if you're a small school versus a large 6a school for instance and we're kind of looking towards um, our concert and sight reading festival in the spring so we're starting to program for that now um, a 6a varsity band so the top band in 6a is required to play i believe it's two grade fives or, or something like uh, like that uh, whereas a varsity band at a 4A would be required to play maybe a 4 and a 3 at their solo con at their concert and sight reading contest. Um, so the standards are all in place, but they're also kind of tailored to the size of the school and the size of the program. So there's a couple things in there that are really interesting to kind of like wrap your head around. But when you, so when you say uh, you're expected to play these things or these certain grade levels, who, who dictates that? Like, is there, are you adjudicate someone come in and say you did your job or is it, is it kind of nebulous still? Yeah. So those, the guidelines for what we are allowed to take to contests in terms of the music and the, um, difficulty of those pieces that's set by the uil board and it, it stays the same every year um, and and they'll make adjustments to it like this year they made adjustments where everyone can play grade level lower than what, the, what it says just because of the current uh, of covid um, but w once we have that program uh, we basically have a so or a concert and sight reading contest um, and similar i know pennsylvania offers those um, in some form these are just um, everyone in your region will go to the contest on the same day and have the same three set of uh, three judges who judge your concert. Um, you get feedback written and audio uh, and then you go right into the site reading room where there's another set of three judges um, and it's a whole day long. Some of them it's a two to three day long contest uh, and every single school in that region will go through and have the same judges uh, follow the same standards. Um, so you, you do get a good idea of where you fall with uh, the programs around you, which kind of goes back into another positive of UIL. Um, when the administrators want to see, well, how did you compare to, I'm going to say Frisco because they're, they're right next door to us. How did you compare to the high schools in Frisco? Um, and they want data. Well, UIL is giving us that data every year. Whether we like that data or not, uh, we have a concrete piece of information that we can give to administration and say, hey, we are outperforming everyone else in our region, or hey, we need more help. Uh, and it gives us that leverage to take to administrators, which is a, a, 
a positive of UAL. So um, along with that idea of maybe either needing more help or knowing you're outperforming people, when you go back to the example that you said of like your fourth band kids, maybe they don't know when they come in, um, they don't know how to play a major scale or something like that. What, how much of knowing that and also knowing that no matter what, you're going to be held to the certain standard um, affects the way you teach it? Because I find that really interesting because that from like a control perspective, we could put the same kids in theory, like in my program and in your program and where they come out is different dependent on the expectation we're pushing towards. I might move slower and try and like nurture some of that more stuff, but is that necessarily the better thing? Because if you're coming out with a stronger product. Yeah, that is such a a case by case and really a year by year um, situation that you get put in of, okay, I know that the people who support our programs and give us the funding. I know that they want to see us come out of UAL with ones, which is the the highest you can get. But at the same time, sometimes it it takes a lot to do that. And that could be you start the UAL music before the new year even happens, Um, which is where I think the downfall of UAL comes into play. When you get so focused on, hey, I need to get a one, regardless of what my kids can do, Um, it is easy to fall into the trap of under programming music just to get that rating or starting music really early, which means the kids only get to play maybe three or four tunes uh, in the spring. Um, And that's kind of one side of it. The other side of it is you just, you plan your year out and you schedule, okay, if I'm going to play Holst first suite at UIL, I know that we better be darn good at, the key of E flat. Um, so you, you, you plan your year around that stuff. So when you get to the, the point where you're going to learn that music, it's, you've already done it. Um, and I think if you take that approach um, and don't think of UAL so much as a, I have to go and I have to get my ones. And if I don't do that, I'm going to lose my funding and they're going to question my abilities. Uh, and you just say, all right, this is a, a stepping stone in the year. It's another performance. It's another concert. Um, and you, program and you know your kids accordingly you can pretty much get through it and have a great experience with it i love this perspective just because i know my experience was not a great one and obviously i left but it was definitely used as and this isn't just my program that it was used this way but it was used almost like a like a threat right so like you have to prep the kids and if you don't prep the kids you can be walked out the door and i think um, a lot of people tended to to use it that way to um, either control the kids or control the staff. And so to hear it put in a context where it's just another stepping stone and we need to be able to work up to that, it really like shifts your perspective of how you can look at it and how you can use it. And um, I think it's wonderful. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, and I think that's, well, Marissa, what you just said is so important i think because especially people who grew up in the system uh, and only have only ever experienced the texas uil system not that that's bad and not that the majority of people don't fall into this but there there are some people who they base their entire year around getting their ones at uil and it is a threat and it is, the kids don't see it as another concert that you get to just make great music um so i think one thing I, i'm just feel lucky for is that I saw the other side and I lived the other side for so long um, that I just need to like I always say we just gotta do our job did we do our job did the kids get better did they have fun did they have a good experience and if you can answer yes like UAL usually goes fine I think there's a really interesting like it's definitely a mentality thing I think you could take it down two different tracks because it's it's funny that you used um first suite as the example because I um when I first started my job, there was an element of marching band was what happened in the fall. And I, I fell in love with concert music by doing classical saxophone. I didn't care as much about marching band because I was a saxophonist. So you're not as relevant as a brass instrument. Um, <laughs> and I, I desperately wanted to get away from everything in the fall as marching band. And we were doing those whole thing. And what I realized is, I was going down my list of these are like the seminal things you should play by the time you leave high school. But the amount that my kids improved in tuning and in intonation and listening 
I, that's probably that piece in and of itself is the one that I could see the biggest growth from day one to day concert. And it's interesting to think um, to maybe really, it sounds like you have to ask yourself more directly than I have to why I would pick a classic work other than it being a classic work um, and really prepping to do it, which is a really nice way to think about it. Um, Marissa, from your perspective is, so your experience with it, it was used a little more in that kind of like, you have to have, a, you have a certain expectation pushed upon you. Is it fair to equate that kind of to these like keystone numbers and things like, and we don't experience it in music, but is it, would you equate it kind of that keystone mentality of the more core classes up here? Yeah. Um, I've always said it felt like teaching to the test. And again, I think that was in retrospect, um, who I was working with in the program that I was working within. Um, but yeah, it definitely felt like if you don't do this, then you can be walked out the door, you can be moved, or maybe you're better fit for middle school or, um, it just felt to me like a constant threat. And it was, um, it was also used in a negative light for the students. It wasn't uplifting for them. It was, we have X, Y, and Z coming up. And if you don't practice, you're going to be really bad. And that's going to be a problem because it wasn't my fault. It's your fault that you didn't do the work. So it was almost used like a cop out in, in many ways as well, which I was also very uncomfortable with because at that point it wasn't us like having fun with the kids. It wasn't making music for the kids. It was, or, or with the kids, it was like, just shoving notes and rhythms down their throat to make sure that they knew exactly um, what was on the page and what they were doing. And hopefully they would do it at contests, but there was absolutely no music making. Like they were playing their instruments, but they weren't making music. And it was such, such a turnoff. It took all the love out of music making for me. And I think, I think a lot of that potentially has to do with who you're working with and where yeah. you're working and things like that. Erin, do you feel, um, coming from PA and going down there, do you, do you miss out on some of those music making moments or do you feel like you get to have those connections and that emotional uh, performance with your kids as well? Yeah, I have definitely had times where um, I have felt like I've done a disservice to my kids because we haven't played some of the staples. Um, and some of that, they, it's not that they aren't exposed. It's that, well, they're in the lower bands. They're in the third band, the fourth band. And um, we're trying to get them the skills so that one day they can play that music. Um, and I, I, I've always had that kind of internal battle of, okay, well, when I was in high school, I, I wasn't as good as some of these kids that we have in our programs down here. I couldn't, they could play circles around me, but I experienced Pulse First Suite. And we played that kind of music um, because my director knew it was a good experience for us and that we should be exposed to it. So there's like that internal struggle of, okay, how do I make sure that my students still get that experience and are still exposed to that and aware of it and can enjoy it um, and grow from it. But how do I also make sure that they have music that they are able to, like Marissa said, just make actual music out of and go beyond just the notes and the rhythms. And um, that, I mean, that that's a battle that, I have every single year, I think, just kind of internal as I'm picking music and thinking about how I'm going to teach it to them. Um, Marissa, you had mentioned that it can turn into sometimes like, um, if you don't learn this, you're going to be in trouble and it's not a good experience. I have to, to go off of that. And now I've been through it five times, five times through the UIL process. And the only times that UIL has gone poorly or I've, expected it to go poorly every single time I've looked at it and found something that I did wrong in my teaching which I think is why it's not why my perception of UAL is a good one and why I like UAL because I if I get to UAL and I'm stressed out because the kids can't play this or they're they're not making music it is never something that UAL put in front of me to block it I can always pinpoint I over programmed or I knew that I was going to have to teach this stuff and I didn't plan for it. Um, every time it's, it's fallen back on my shoulders as the teacher, never fallen back on, well, UIL mandated this or dictated this. It's never been that case. And I think that's where some of the 
and maybe I'm assuming, and I'm maybe like speaking for uh, people other than myself, but I think that that's where I think uh, some of the challenge comes when you look from an outside into that, because the one thing I know of Texas programs is how strong they are musically. And that's all I ever really knew. And that was my exposure really until we started talking. And then I started working with Marissa and I heard more of that. Um, and I could see very easily how that, like just that expectation and things like that go, but that reflectiveness of being able to turn and say, what could I have done differently is something maybe that in the looser structures and I use looser generously that we have here, maybe you don't do that self-reflection as often because you don't have to, there's no metric. You just have, if the kids aren't as strong that year, eh, you don't put the concert on that strongly. Marissa, go ahead. I thought you had something. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> so one more thing about the, the, the piece selection and things like that. And you want to make sure that you're, you're giving them those opportunities and things like that. When you talk about the list of pieces that you can choose from, it's, do you find it for people that don't know anything about UIL, do you find it expansive enough that you can make a varied repertoire? And at least, even if you don't necessarily feel like you gave them those Holst moments right away, can you walk away saying, I gave them quality repertoire? Um, yes. And that's a, I mean, that's a loaded question. And some people will give a hard note to that. Some people will give a yes. I, it, a lot of factors. It depends the grade five list might not be as good as the grade three list or the grade three list might not be as good as the grade four list. Um, I have never had a year where I haven't been able to find something that benefits my kids off of the list. Um, and then um, you're able to add music and a lot of directors, I don't think take the time to do that. If there's a piece that you're passionate about and you know that it is right for your kids, you can get it added to the, to the PML, the prescribed music list. Um, and that's the list that we go off of. Um, so yes, we are limited um, using that loosely um, because again, if we just take the right steps, you can get stuff added. And if you dig deep enough, you can find music that's good for your kids on that list. Now, on the other side, yeah, there is a lot of music that's not on it that should be on it, so. Um, when you talk about the, like the, the festivals or the, the competition kind of elements that you go is there a competition element to it or is it strict is it kind of like clinical in terms of you go on stage you get uh adjudicated and then you move to the next part uh yeah it's more like a clinic um it's not really a oh i need to make sure that uh or our kids aren't going oh we need to beat this high school and do better than this it's not like a school to school kind of contest it's very much like a clinic a revolving door if you walk on stage you sit down play your concert and then you stand up, walk into the sight reading room, and then you get on your bus and go home. Um, so it is a lot of a clinic. And um, more so on that clinic side of things, most districts or regions will have a pre-UIL um, to kind of prep us. And that is a full clinic where you go on, do the concert, and then get a clinic afterwards. Um, and then you go do sight reading and then get a clinic afterwards from those sight reading judges. Um, so I think UIL and each individual region has done a good job of making sure that this isn't just a one day thing that you come in, play your concert and you move past it. Um, it, it, it is an educational experience. And again, if you take advantage of um, that aspect of it. Do you, so you don't really get an opportunity. Um, and again, because up here we're a little more structured in terms of like jazz is competition based and things like that. Do you, your kids don't get an opportunity often to watch other groups, do they? Um, not at UIL, no, not at the contest. Um, maybe uh, if a varsity and a non-varsity band perform close to each other, that group will stay and watch a few. Um, now, you, you are able to, um, and I'm sure you could. Um, it, the contests are open to parents, and it's open to audiences. They're open to the public. Uh, they do happen during the school day, though, so most schools uh. will um, – you miss the morning and then you're still in class in the afternoon. Um, so we just try to get kids back to school, but you could. Do you ever wish that that was, I, I remember this like very, I had, I had, I had a phenomenal jazz band one year and they were just missing that extra little step and I couldn't figure out what exactly and where to get them. And they had an A and an open category and we were, we were A and open was a little above us and they had the top A bands and the top open bands at the same time, but they were after us. And I made a point of saying, more than any other year, I want you in the auditorium watching them. And it was so cool to sit back and watch them 
watch these high schoolers play same level rep that they were playing, but they have that extra little that they put into it. And I remember them looking around and it was like that aha moment of why do they sound like that? And we're like just that little bit under. And it was the difference is those moments where you like, you're not sure you want to practice, you want to do this. And it was this amazing moment. And it's been like pedal to the metal ever since. Um, do you think there's any benefit to that? Or would you, I know you can't explore it necessarily if you're in school at those times, but I love that element. Yeah, no, I absolutely. Um, and I, we do that so much with marching band. Like we go to a contest and then we sit and watch the bands that are after us because they're usually better. Like they're going on later. And that spark, like you watch those groups and you're like, oh, I want to be like that. Um, and that, that drives marching band a lot of the time. And the exact same thing happens with concert band. And I mean, that's why in jazz band, we say you have to, you have to listen. You have to know what you want to sound like before you do it. Or what's the best way to learn jazz? Just listen to it. Know what, know what the great people do. Um, absolutely. Um, and I think that would be a piece of UAL that, um, if we were able to sit and watch the heavy hitters that are out there playing music that, um, most colleges don't play, um, that just is another chance to drive the programs. I, it's one of my, um, my most favorite things is that like level of sportsman. I, you muted because... I think you heard your dog. My dog is snoring right here. So if you hear a dog still, it's mine. My dog is, she is not <laughs> loving the fact that I'm not cuddling with her right now. <laughs> Mine's snoring. So it's equal. Um, but one of my most favorite things about, I'm, I'll speak to myself, band kids is one of the things they've missed most during COVID is competition. And I would say most of them are missing because we had a very, we would have had a pretty good run of things this year, but then simultaneously, they just like watching the other bands and they're like, I want to know how we stack up and blah, blah, blah. But they're never that the way they explain it, they make it sound like they're going to be these like cutthroat competitors. But then every single time a band leaves the field, everyone's like clapping, they're yelling, they're so happy for each other. And I love that level of competition, but they're like just in love with just hearing the music the whole time. It's something that I, I think arguably miss that more than the competition itself this year for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I can't agree with that more. I mean, at the end of the day, like, they're all just a bunch of band kids. Like, like you can say, like, I want to, I want to beat them and I need to be better than that. And then you watch it or that you talk about the contest. And it's like, oh my gosh, did you see them do X, Y, and Z? Like, at the end of the day, they're all just a bunch of band kids doing band. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I had, um, and I think as a, as a director, it's cool also to be able to see, um, see what everyone else is doing and one of the things that i find enjoyable in those competitions is when you see the same song pop up three or four times and you hear three or four different interpretations of it as you go um because i think marissa to your earlier point of you felt like maybe that music making element was gone um whether they mean to or not suddenly when they hear like that song a little faster or this thing out of balance or a different balance, they're inevitably having those conversations. And before you know it, they're doing those music making things that when you try and do in class, they roll their eyes and go, that's, this is not what I'm here for. Just let me play my trumpet. <laughs> yeah. I like, I didn't get that far down the line, so I can't speak to it um, from a Texas point of view, but I, again, I like I was in a very negative situation in general, but but yeah, I mean, we experienced that up here, um, or I love when I play even just like a YouTube recording or something for my kids after we've been working on a song and they hear, um, you know, the balance is a little different. Oh, I didn't realize that was there, or it was supposed to be this tempo, or ooh, their dynamics are so much better, whatever it is. Yeah, it it definitely does uh, something, and um, Kevin and I work together, and we make it a point for our kids to hear each other often throughout the year for those same reasons you know what's the band doing what's the orchestra doing um how does the choir utilize this, that and the other thing so yeah yeah and I, I mean i even try to relate it back to like okay in my own playing like when i'm playing tuba or i'm teaching someone to play tuba and i want them to sound a certain way well what do i do i grab my tuba and i play it for them or i go find the tuba player that i want to sound like and i hear it like why is that any different for how we approach concert band? Um, so. I love um, 
one thing that my violin professor in college always used to say, there's like such a negative um, perception, I guess, of listening to recordings and trying to copy like the famous violinists out there. And he always said like, if you're gonna try and copy someone, might as well copy the best. So yeah, please go listen, please try and copy. He's like, you're not going to copy them anyway, but <laughs> like, might as well try because that's how we want it to sound, you know? And I, I used to love that yeah. about him, it was funny. I heard a, um, I read a quote in a book. The book is called Steal Like an Artist. And it's just this idea of like how to affect and how to do different things. And the quote was, um, it was something to the effect of like everything worth saying has already been said. People just weren't paying attention to it when it was first mentioned. So this, I like that idea of like, you can probably sit on tuba or saxophone or violin and go, I want to sound like this. And if you look far enough, you're bound to find someone that not only thought the same thing as you, but sounds like that um, for sure. Um, away from the festival thing and going back to like the school community and stuff yeah. like that, I think one of the things, especially unfortunately right now because of COVID, we're, we're fighting this idea of like what is the arts identity in a school? And I think the, the happy answer and the clean answer is it has such a public face, especially from a band perspective and your marching band and parades. Um, but it doesn't always feel like that when the doors close and like you have your music wings and you have that for different things, but it also can feel very isolating. Um, the fact that UIL is what it is and the level that it is, do you find your identity in your school community is, I don't want to use the word validated, but it's like the word that's coming to mind, like to people that aren't in the music program, do you feel that you have more ownership over you? Uh, yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And I think it's because every one of those extracurricular programs and then even academics is governed by UIL. And then like the, the, the umbrella is UIL. And then within that, there's the UIL music and the UIL athletics and academics. Um, so I think because for us, they've kind of raised us up and raised uh, the arts and music education up um, to be on the same playing field as the rest of those groups. Um, it does make us more recognized in the school and in the community. Um, even things as simple as we get a one. Well, everyone knows what that means because every other group that's going to go to UAL also gets rated on a one or a two or three. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, it helps. Is is the rating even? Is the the one like the scale in terms of that where one is the best? Is that for strictly music, or does that equate in like an understandable way between academics and athletics as well? Um, not so much into athletics and academics, but for all of the, the music side of it. So choir, orchestra, solo and ensemble, marching band, concert band, everyone's kind of rated, even theater, rated on those same uh, standards of a one is, all right, you've, you've made it, you, you did what you needed to do. Um, Marissa, as someone who left, like, or, and I know that you didn't have the most ideal circumstance in terms of that, but going from that to what we have now where a lot of our and again, I know this is kind of generalizing, but a lot of our school identity to the outward public, it has to do with our, our science, our English and our mathematics. Um, and there's a, and don't get me wrong, there's a freedom with that. There's like a nice freedom with not having that kind of oversight. But what would you, what would you say to having, to giving up a little bit of that freedom for a little bit more of that, like recognition and ability to have more influence? Well, I'm not sure if I completely agree with you on that statement. I think that the mindset up here is still very much music is secondary to core, but I don't know if science is necessarily representing our school. I would say sports represent I mean, school. And I would agree. I meant more from a, um, from like the, like a keystone perspective okay. in terms of like your, your school rating in that terms. I agree with you. I think okay. there's, so I guess to that point, to, clarified a little more um if ui has the academics the athletic and the, the music side of things and it has those elements i absolutely think from a an athletic perspective you have a certain school identity and from academics it's more of that keystone like pssa scores that side of things and we are a little more secondary would you rather give some of it up and have it be kind of three equal branches um or do you like having the freedom we have that's tricky because I think one of the things that I really did love about my Texas program was 
the kids and their drive and their playing abilities. I mean, some of my middle schoolers were playing concertos that I played um, in college. Like, and that's not an exaggeration for this podcast. Like, some of these kids were like truly, truly incredible, and it wasn't an anomaly either. Like, we sometimes get one or two of those kids in our program. Um, but in terms of being held to a standard, I I like the freedom we have, especially as we move into what I think is going to be a new era of music education, which incorporates a lot more popular music and a lot more um, composition and that sort of thing, which has also made, not that this is going to last forever, but it's also made our COVID lives a little bit easier because we're not trying to fit into a contest format. We're not trying to prep the kids for anything. If we didn't want to do something, we didn't. If we wanted to try something new or flip it on its head or forget about X, Y, and Z for this year, then we just did what we did. Um, So I like the freedom, but that's not to say that if I had had a more positive experience, I also probably would have still been down there because I left because of a very unique circumstance not necessarily because of UIL or the expectations of the Texas programs. In hindsight, I like what we get to do up here and like my graduate research and all that kind of stuff surrounded creativity and composition and all of that kind of stuff. And so now I have a very big hand in it and it has shaped a lot of my career and my connections. We probably wouldn't be doing this podcast right now without some of, you know, the stuff that has stemmed from that. But would I also like to um, hold our kids a little bit more accountable and have them take it a little bit more serious? Yeah. But the other caveat to all of that is we have 2,500 kids in our building and Aaron has 20,000. And so the kids down in Texas were pulled one direction and it was wherever they chose to be pulled. And then they were truly dedicated to that one thing. Whereas our kids are in band, choir, and orchestra, plus they play football, plus they're trying out for theater, and they're on debate club, and they do, you know, like, so they're pulled in all of these different directions, and in our world, I think that is, uh, I don't want to say the expectation, but it's it's what we allow our kids to do, and that philosophy of having a well-rounded education is valued up here, where I think down in Texas, it was very much like, you do your academics, and then you pick one thing and that one thing dominated your entire free time and that was it and so you got very good at one thing you got really really good at it and your academics but Aaron do you see um and I totally agree in terms of what you said Marissa where I I feel like we're we're seeing I don't know if we 100% know where the finish line is of this shift of what like music is turning into right now partially because of COVID but also just because of it's up here i like it really the name of the game is like it's like the burden of choice like you can have a thousand things and i never in my wildest dreams thought i'd have a fifth grader tell me they couldn't come to this concert because they had their their pitching lessons their individual pitching lessons that night it's like how right what what are you between like a a 20 and a 30 mile an hour fastball like it was just wild to me but that was (laughs) that was what it was and that's where it was at and the kid's great like i know him still he's playing high school baseball and that was where he realized he was but that wasn't something that we had um since your your element the uil element is a little more structured are you seeing any shift in how music is taken or are you a little more stuck in the ways makes it sound negative and i don't mean it negative at all are you more established um no i don't um uil i think is going to continue to mold with whatever whatever comes of from this um and right now uil is just making sure that we can still have the region band and the area and the state uh and still have a concert and sight reading contest just to kind of honestly i think it's just to help maintain a sense of normalcy right now um so we're still having our auditions for region and all of that it's just virtual it's all on an, on the music first app um, and we're still, this um, concert and sight reading contest is still planned to be as normal, um, but it could also turn into a virtual thing where we send recordings. So right now, 
UIL is, is doing a great job at making sure we're still able to give our students the experiences that make them just feel normal and grounded, which right now I think is so important. Um, the other side of that, um, we actually, um, Prosper, we didn't compete in UIL this year for marching band. We, you are able to not do it. Um, and especially in a year like this, it just wasn't right for us to do that. We didn't have a band camp. Uh, we didn't see the whole band together until like the second or third week of school. Um, so it just wasn't right for us to go to UAL. So we, we decided not to, and we didn't do the big competitive marching show. We just did something a little bit um, that just was less involved so that if a kid needed to be home with their family for a week or two weeks, they could, and it was fine. Um, so UIL does give some grace with that as well. We didn't have to compete in UIL, and we decided not to because it wasn't right for us. Um, in a normal year, you, you still don't have to do it. Um, it's just kind of the expectation because it does govern so many other parts of a student's daily experience in school down here. So it's expected, uh, but if it's not right, it's not right. You don't have to do it. How much... Um do you enjoy the sight read? I, I miss, I genuinely miss the sight reading. It used to be a component of the jazz championships and it's the only time it would ever show up. Um, I love, I thought it was so much fun just to see how it happens. What do you think about that I, as like a measurement? I love it. I think I have a ton of fun in sight reading and it's a little bit selfish because like we get to perform a little bit too as the, like the director. Um, because I mean, it's like, it's an intense seven minutes and the way our system has been set up before they, they have changed it for this current year and for the future, we get seven minutes to the kids look at the piece. We have four minutes where the kids can, um, they can't make sounds, they can't pop their keys, they can't blow air. We can't, we can only say certain words to them. And then we get the rest of the time to, again, we, we have limitations on what we can say and how we can say it and how we can do it and what the kids can do. And then it's like, all right, turning music over. All right, here we go. Like, I think the sight reading process is awesome. Um, and I mean, it's a great experience for the kids. It really, well, if the kids are not engaged and actively thinking and um, using all of their knowledge and context clues, like they aren't going to do a great job. Um, so I love sight reading. I think it's awesome. Marissa, you made a look when he said that, were you not a, a sight reader? I'm a sight reading fan. I mean, I'm never a sight reading fan because I'm a violinist and we like things to be just so. <laughs> it is a whirlwind, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I do remember like prepping my kids for it down here. I never went through the official UIL process, so um, I can't really speak to it. Although I will say if there was one part that was made to sound the scariest, it was the sight reading. That's all anybody ever talked about was the sight reading, the sight reading and like, but there was prep to it. So kind of what Aaron was speaking to, like, you know, it's coming. So you better prep your kids to do it. Like teaching them yeah. how to shadow bow or look over things while you're working with another section, um, things like that. But I think a key part of a lot of what was missing was also the time and the care to prep them for things like audiation and um, being able to sing their parts and, you know, it was just like yep. kill and drill in my experience. So if I was still down there and I had the wisdom to kind of live my life and then return to the same situation, I would probably eat it up in kind of an excited way because I think there's a lot of value to it. Yeah. I always enjoyed, um, my kid, I, I think they, they're notorious for like, if I listen to it, I'll be fine. And I try so hard. And I think it's, it's a constant battle. Every time I put a new piece in front of them, they're like, well, if we don't play it well enough three or four times, like he'll have no choice. He'll have to play the recording. And I loved the sight reading thing. Cause there was no, there's no out and they're always better at it than they expect to be. But um, I love the mention of the audiation thing, Marissa, because that's when I think it started to click that they were getting it. Cause like I've done, you're like in the parking lot with the whole marching band and they're rushing something. You say, no, audiate it. And you start it and the majors are conducting. You just look around. This will do nothing for audio people. But like you just see all the kids going. Yeah. And you're like, perfect. Good. They're getting that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Rissa, you were like to some of your points. You were like 100 percent spot on with, I think, what like every Texas music educator has been thinking about the sight reading process. 
like you do miss out on a lot of things that actually are beneficial like what is the point in teaching this hardcore like military procedure of how we're going to walk into a sight reading room like when are you, you're not going to do that you're not going to pick up a solo to sight read and like only say certain words and not pop your keys and don't blow air like you're never going to do that wow so wow it's fun for us like in the moment it's like not realistic so texas kind of got rid of that whole process for this year and then for the future and we basically get a certain amount of time here's your piece we'll be back in seven minutes do what you need to do um so oh, okay it's awesome like we're gonna be able to actually teach like realistic um skills for sight reading not the like super structured and regimented unrealistic process while still fun not really beneficial <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> I also, and that's, that's nice that they're as fluid and understanding both of the situation, but also the changing norms, because who knows, like, they might discover unintentionally that that's the way, better way to demonstrate what's happening. So, sure, which would be kind of neat. Um, it's kind of like a wrap up, Aaron, this is a little bit of a, you kind of touched on it right there, but I think we all go through stages of like when we're high school going to college, then when we're college and we're getting ready to have our job. We all have these like visions and ideas of how our, our programs will go and what they'll do. And I'm sure that as you grew up and um, went to school and college up here in PA, and then you went to get a job down there um, five years in, like how has your, your program vision that you had before coming to Texas now melded with, this like UIL mentality, how's it, what's your overall program structure now? Yeah, um, so I was actually just talking to our fine arts director about this. He asked me, what do you think, what have you brought from Pennsylvania down here? Like what, what is helping you? And I think so much of it is, and my mom was a band director in Pennsylvania for 35 years. Um, and you have to be resilient in Pennsylvania and you have to adapt. And you have to take what you're given and just make the best of it. And it's not easy. I, my mom taught in a janitor's closet for some years and didn't have windows in her classroom for the majority of her time and traveled between four schools. So that's just resilience and adaptability. Um, now coupled with all of the support and funding and resources that Texas has, um, I think has just made it a uniquely just overwhelmingly positive experience for me um, because uh, I see and I know the other side um, and we are super lucky down here um, to have the support and the funding and the, the groups like UIL to, to set standards in place that we need to follow um, while some are restricting and at the end of the day, it just helps us push our programs forward. I tell um, anytime I'm talking to someone who hasn't had experience outside of Texas band, um, the reason Texas programs are better is has nothing to do with the teaching. Um, the teachers here are no better than any teacher anywhere. Um, in fact, I could not teach a day in Pennsylvania. Um, talking to Chris, who was on our last podcast, Chris Valentine, like the his job is hard um the amount of directions that teachers are pulled and the hours um we are just super lucky our kids have band every day from the time they're in sixth grade to a senior in high school they have it every day for at least 45 minutes um so it's not a matter of we teach any differently we just happen to see our kids more <laughs> um and i think that kind of being humbled by that that this isn't us. This is not an educator thing. This is just the process has been, it's honestly been figured out down here from an education standpoint, from a value of music education. And that's why the programs are how they are. And a lot of that stems back to UIL. I know that was supposed to be a wrap up question, but like, I have a question. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not you. So does that translate? I felt like when I was down in Texas, everything, like everything was bigger, but that also meant like everything was better like the core education classes also seemed to be doing better and the athletics were obviously very well funded and doing better like if you put a texas football team against the pennsylvania football team it doesn't matter if they're number one in pennsylvania they'll 
still probably get killed by the majority, right? So like just everything. And I felt like the kids were more invested in their academics. Is it, is it the whole system or are you speaking like just to music in this case? I don't have like a super informed answer for the whole system. Music, I think so. I think because music is so integrated in the core of a school system, I think that is the driving force behind how Texas bands got to how they are. Um, now, some things that I do know, I know that during the school day, if you're in the fo- on the football team, you have a class for that during the day. You have an athletic period. So similar to band, like we get our kids during the school day and then we also get them for the rehearsals. Um, the same thing happens in athletics. So they see them during the school and then they see them at practice. And that during the school day class goes all year long. So even when the sport's not in season, they're still training. I would imagine that helps make those programs stronger. Um, but again, not, not a super informed perspective on that outside of the band world. Okay. I have so many thoughts, but like, because we're almost <laughs> at an hour here, I'm going to reserve them. Um, but no, I just think it's interesting. I felt that way. And maybe that goes back to the, you know, you pick one thing and then that's what fits in your schedule. Sure. That's your activity. I don't know, but I felt that way about academics too. And I feel like just like science up here is pushed so much and, um, or, you know, or the STEM subjects, not even science, you know, they're pushed right. so much that kids are willing to give up their other activities, even if they are worked into a schedule for those experiences. And, oh, just a big old question mark there. The pin in it. One of the things I'm most excited for in terms of this podcast stuff is I love these conversations of, I'm going to assume based on where a lot of people seem to listen from at the moment, um, not as many people have exposure to like the Texas model of things. And like I said, going into the first time uh, we spoke with Aaron, what I knew of the Texas programs is just that they were really good. And that's what I knew. And I never knew why. And it's probably partially because I never asked the question why, but to really talk about how it's structured and things like that is really cool. And I agree with Marissa. I feel like I could, I could ask a million more questions in terms of like specifically marching band or jazz or concert and things like that. So it's really cool to hear about um, what people are doing in different spots of the country and what they're having success with. So I appreciate you uh, giving time again and coming back to uh, run through it and chat because it's really cool to hear what's happening elsewhere in the country. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Um, so we're going to, we'll link uh, a lot of the similar stuff that has probably been linked for Aaron in the previous episode. I believe Marissa is this going to be, it's, I know it'll be the same, but it's, um, this episode will be right after the band director one. Um, perfect. So we'll, uh, it's we'll tomorrow. have that linked and it's tomorrow. <laughs> um, we'll have that linked and we'll have it set up. So Aaron, thank you again for taking a little bit of extra time to go thank through you. some of that stuff with us. Yeah. Awesome.